Today I wanted to do something a little different on why the majority of physicists are wrong. And this is in part in response to some comments I occasionally get, is like, why do you think you're smarter than every other physicist? Well, first of all, I don't think I'm smarter. I'm probably or possibly average for physicists. I have though a talent for thinking outside the box. And I'm also willing to reconsider any theory, as any good scientist should. Now I came across a YouTube video from a TEDx talk by Paul Rolkins, and it's titled Why the Majority is Always Wrong. And if you actually look into theories of thinking, when it comes to high performance, as he says, or solving problems that have never been solved before, you don't do it by believing the same thing that the majority does. If you follow the majority, all you get is incremental improvement. And with that, I'll play a short clip from him. And if you want to have results that you've never had before, well, you need to start doing things you've never done before. Now, the key question for today is, of course, is there a method to the madness? Is there a way that each of us can do impossible things to truly create dramatic results? And the good news is that the answer to that question is yes. Because what I'm going to explain today is, when it comes to high performance, why the majority is always wrong and how you can use that to get everything you can out of everything you've got. When people, teams and organizations, whenever they hit a wall, they tend to do one of two things. They either do more of the same things, or they do less of the same things. But what you very seldom see is that they start to do different things instead. And it's interesting, if you look at the data, approximately 3% of people are inclined to even do different things. And the remaining 97% continues to smash into the wall, like some kind of crazy energy bunny on steroids. So as he says, you have to try new approaches in order to get new results. You don't solve the missing matter problem by trying to do the same thing people have been doing for 50 years. You don't solve the problem of what's the cause of inertia by ignoring it or what's the cause of electromagnetic acceleration. So these are all things that we have to look at. And there's a, a method to it. And the first part is realizing that the majority is wrong. You just flat out say that. The majority is wrong. And Richard Feynman said that science is the belief in the ignorance of experts or something along those lines. And so you have to come in with that approach and look at things with fresh eyes if you're really going to make a breakthrough. And then you need to say, I'm not going to do the same thing everybody else does because I'll get the same result. Certainly it's wonderful if someone gets a new equation where they get two decimal places, more accurate numbers. That's good, that, that's a necessary part of physics too. But that doesn't get you a big change. That doesn't make a big improvement in our understanding of physics. You have to do something different. And with that, I'll play a second clip by it. Now here's the thing, if your brain is an automatic pilot, this leads to what the scientists call mental myopia also known as tunnel vision. And uh, if you have tunnel vision, uh, that's a bit of a problem because it confuses people about their own performance. And this is the reason that many people go through life acting like a mediocre race car driver who sits in his car, looks in his rearview mirror, sees his competition, and is so far behind that they think they are first.
In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we tend to think inside the box, and the box is a very good metaphor here. So let me draw a box. And if you take a close look at the box, you see that the boundaries of this box are very well defined. Because the reality is that the box in which we think looks more like this. <laughs> Now, for those of you in the back who cannot see it, the reason is this is a very small box. So as Paul says, you have to avoid getting tunnel vision and learn to think out of the box. And a big part of that is understanding that you're in a box. And I draw here a box of the natural physical laws, which is how I say these are the real laws of nature, not our laws. And what you think you know may be this other box, which doesn't necessarily overlap with the real laws. But what you really know is this small box here. And probably it's tinier than that. In my case, when I do my quantum field theory research, I start with the particle pair model of quantum fluctuations. Electron-positron pairs, proton-antiproton pairs. Just a really tiny, teeny tiny box. And then see how that affects every other theory, every other major theory and try to answer questions that people haven't answered before, starting with that one little thing. And so that's what I do. And every physicist, even if they're an expert in their part of the field, may only know a little teeny tiny field. If you actually look at the titles in journals and you look at all the headings and all the different categories, there are hundreds and hundreds of categories in physics. And if you're an expert in one or two, then you're pretty good. And no one's an expert in all of it. So even as far as what we know as a race, individual physicists only know a small, tiny fraction of what we know. And then that's only a tiny fraction of what's real. And then it's not even all real. If you look at Popsi, it probably goes here, just barely touches the reality. If you read popular science articles all the time. So we have to realize where we are and what we know. And then figure out what don't we know. As David Dunning says, Even the experts don't know what they don't know. And they can't improve unless they learn something they don't know. And how do you do that? Well, you research people who have found ways to poke holes in current theory. That's a good start because then you find out you have a problem. So I'll read scientists who poke holes in current theories and study their arguments. I'll even read crackpots. Because one thing crackpots are good at is poking holes in existing theory. Well, people like to ignore crackpots because they come up with their crackpot idea to solve the problem. Well, I'll give you a little secret. Physicists come up with crackpot ideas to solve the problems too. And Knowing which is which, what's a good idea and what's a crackpot idea is difficult unless you have a good base of knowledge. And just because their solution is a crackpot idea doesn't mean that pointing out the problem isn't real. We can't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as they say. If we, once we realize that something's a logical impossibility, You got to exit out, and we have to work on fixing it. As I said, the first part of fixing the problem is knowing that you have a problem. And then you have to figure out a way to think out of the box in order to solve it. Now, scientists have found 
a couple different ways that they work. One way is incremental improvement, where you just go step by step. And you get small improvements that way, of course, but not big improvements. And one way that I use is a way people have found is when you combine two different ideas that have never been combined in the same way before. And that's what I was thinking about when I was writing a chapter on weak interactions. How does beta decay happen? How does particle decay happen? How does specifically neutron decay happen? And I happen also to be thinking about Hawking radiation. And, and I thought, well, what happens if the neutron captures the positron, like a black hole capturing one particle from a quantum fluctuation, because that would convert the neutron to a proton, and the electron would still be outside and escape, and all of a sudden you have neutron decay. And that was by combining two different ideas, the idea of how a neutron decays and the idea of Hawking radiation that just happened to be in my brain at the same time. And I put the two together. And that's when I started writing about that as an alternative intera weak interaction of how weak interactions are initiated. So that's another way that breakthrough happens. And, and that's often the predominant one and then the other thing you can do is eliminate everything that's impossible so that the only thing left is possible, the truth. And so you go through, through with a checkbox and every theory that doesn't work because it has a fatal flaw, you exit out and when you're done, you look at what's left. And what I find is generally there's only one thing left, and that's the truth. And I also find that usually it goes back to basic quantum field theory, that you figure out what the quantum fluctuations are doing in any interaction, and you find out what's really going on. And that's really the reason for what I feel is my success with my new and innovative research is that I just happen to be applying one idea that touches everything. I have this tiny little box, but it has spider webs that go everywhere. So with that, I'll play a third clip by him. Because what we have found is that breakthrough innovation, extraordinary results happen when people decide to finally break the standards or the norms in their industry or professional field. So, ladies and gentlemen, what it tells us, there is a method to the madness. And by understanding that the majority is always wrong when it comes to high performance, finally you have the opportunity to quit fixing things and move to massive innovation instead. Ladies and gentlemen, the Roman Emperor, Marcus Aurelius, once said that the object of life is not to side with the majority, but the object of life is to escape finding oneself joining the ranks of the clinically insane. If you do what everyone else is doing, you're not distinguishing yourself and you're probably stuck. And this is why, when it comes to high performance, the majority is always wrong. So he ends with the nice anecdote that leads to the common phrase, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting a different result. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of physicists do. They do the same things over and over again and expect to get a different result when what they need to do is figure out what they're wrong about and then figure out a new solution. But I will say science has another problem. 
Because if 97% of us, as Paul Rothen said, are unable to come up with the original idea to save their life, then it's up to the 3% of us who can to come up with the new ideas. But those 97% are going to hate you and they are going to do everything they can to prevent you from succeeding. And those 97% are the ones that work for the journals. And when you get a peer reviewer, you've got a 97% chance of getting one of them. So more than likely your peer reviewer can't see out of his box, can't see a new idea that actually makes sense when it confronts him. So the journal and peer review system inhibits out-of-the-box thinking, which is part of the reason why physics hasn't had major advancements in the last 50 years. And even some of the advancements 50 years prior were incremental advancements. They weren't the major type of advancement that would really move physics forward. So that's why I think that I'm right about things and other people are wrong. First of all, I can say that what's logically impossible and theoretically impossible. And I do videos about it so that other people can know. I try to spread the word so other people can see the problems, so scientists can work on it. And even if you're not a scientist, you're a taxpayer. And if you don't want your tax money being thrown away on ridiculous research, let people know. You can, you can have an effect on the science too. Or if someone is doing something silly, laugh at them. I will post comments and articles. If something is a popular science article is science fiction, I'll say it's science fiction. And if people are laughing at scientists for doing science fiction instead of real science, then maybe they'll change. Maybe they'll try to do change. And the think out of the box, but inside the real box, not out of the box in La La Land. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. And I hope you understand now why the majority of physicists are wrong. Until we fix a lot more of our theories that will remain wrong. And happily so, because another problem is scientists have, a lot of physicists have big egos and they don't want to admit that they're wrong. They, they don't even want to admit that the theory tells them that they're wrong because everybody else is wrong in every other field. But physicists want to be special. They want to be right about everything that they believe today. So with that, I'll get off my soapbox. And I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll put links to some of my books, so if you want to read one of my books and learn more about my research, then you're welcome to do so, and I hope you learn a lot. And so thanks for watching.